I'm Bob Short. This is Reflections on Georgia Politics, sponsored by the Duckworth Library at Young Harris College and the Richard B. Russell Library for Political Research and Studies at the University of Georgia. We're back with uh, Chuck Clay, state senator, chairman of the Republican Party. And Chuck, we'd like to pick up where we left off last time. Your brain's better than <laughs> <laughs> no, a lot better than mine. Was that fishing or what we did last summer? <laughs> <laughs> well, we uh, in the right direction. In, in, in our previous conversation, we had talked about some of the things of which you were very proud during your service. Oh, yes, sir. On the county commission. Okay. Now we'd like to talk about some of the things that you remember and are proud of during your what ten years? Twelve years. Twelve, 12 years, years in the Georgia State Senate. Um, first, uh, you know, make sure we keep this in check. I'm not sure when you're the members. I've spent 10 of my 12 years in the minority. Uh, one can debate uh, the, uh, uh, you know, significant ramifications of minority uh, party legislators. However, having said that, I will say that I tried to take the role of legislating very seriously. And when I say a member of minority, I came there when we were uh, really an irrelevant minority. Paul Coverdale was the Senate leader. Uh, Johnny Isaacson was the House leader, and uh, we were our, our opinions were asked almost in a, as an afterthought, as opposed to any significant input <laughs> into uh, into legislation. But that doesn't mean you are irrelevant. And I think, in many respects, it was a wonderful school to figure out how, when you have no ability with yourself or your party to pass legislation, that you pass legislation. And we were never, and, and I would say that when Zell Miller was lieutenant governor and Pierre Howard was lieutenant governor and even Mark Taylor uh, was lieutenant governor and even when the, the sort of the nemesis, if you will, of, of the Republicans uh, in the House with uh, Speaker Murphy and his trusted lieutenants like Bill Lee, I never felt either put upon or poorly treated because I came as a Republican. What you had to realize, you weren't going to be on the conference committee of the budget. <laughs> you weren't going to be sitting there in the Green Door Committee meetings uh, with the Speaker and the Lieutenant Governor and the Governor uh, when, those, when the big dollar issues were being divvied up. So you had to learn to legislate sort of in the niches. And you had to learn, how to learn seriously how to build coalitions on bills that were probably not partisan. But if you were serious about it and worked hard, you could get things done. And, and role models like a Paul Coverdale in the Senate and Johnny Isaacs in the House were, were two people that I admired because they were serious legislators. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about some bills, but one of the things that I told myself when I first went down there, I guess a little bit of, of just sort of common sense politics, is before you say a whole lot, watch. And, and I may have said this before, but it was to me is watch who your fellow senators or House members go to when there's a complex or difficult issue on the floor. And forget who has a title. Forget who's the chairman or whatever. See who the people go to in those bodies when it's a tough issue. And whether it, it, it was a Culver kid or whether it uh, was a Paul Coverdale, uh, whether it was a Johnny Isaacson, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Thomas Allgood. I mean, I could go down and, and uh, people that when there's a complex issue, they went to. You follow those folks and learn how they do things and you can get things done. I tried to feel, I came as, as, a, as, a, as a county commissioner and I came in as a former prosecutor. Uh, so the first things I really tried to work on were some what I thought law and order issues. The one that I'm single most proud of in, in the law and order area, and I give Zell Miller a lot of credit because he let me, when he revamped and really started getting tough on DUIs, uh, I had a little bill that would have that reduced the uh, uh, blood alcohol levels from a .10 to a .08 and eliminated the presumptive .12, .0, and just said at .08, your DUI. And uh, he ultimately incorporated that bill as, uh, uh, as either in the conference committee or an amendment as part of his overall DUI package. Uh, he didn't initially want to add that in there uh, because he thought it might snag it up in the House and didn't want to have that controversy defeat other very fine aspects of his bill. Ultimately, by that kind of hard work I'm talking about, it became clear that we could get it passed and he let us include that uh, in his overall package and it saved lives. And I can tell you, if you go to one meeting of, uh, of, of the mad and watch a day in the life of a parent who's lost a son or a daughter to a drunk driver, uh, it changed me forever. And it ought to be lower. I can't do that now. You know, we, 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 
we, we don't let airline pilots or truck drivers have any alcohol, none, zero alcohol in their system for 12 hours. You can go out and have two or three martinis as long as you're a civilian driver and be out on the road. Another issue for another time, but I was proud to have been part of that. Um, I passed the first bill in this country that said you, 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 to make it a, an additional crime for a spouse to be abused in front of the children because children learn about spousal abuse from watching generally the mother be abused by an abusive father. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can't, you know, there, there was already crimes on the book about abuse, but there was nothing on the book that said there was an additional delinquency or a, 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 you know, cruelty to children uh, charge that, um, that, w that, that could be imposed for doing it in front of the kids. Uh, and I got roundly booed and hissed by a lot of folks as being sort of a right wing, and we only passed it as a, uh, uh, as a misdemeanor offense. Later, Mark Taylor incorporated that into one of his key campaign things um, and, and raised that to a felony. But I was proud to see, again, a small area that you negotiated in a, in a, uh, in, in a niche that I think is good law. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's the kind of things you did in the minority. I, I, I like to think we're environmentalists. I, I dramatically expanded the Metropolitan River Protection Act as a, as a Republican uh, a senator and expanded that and extended the protection of our, of our uh, 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 rivers and the setbacks from the rivers to hopefully begin some of the limitation on pollutants that flow into the rivers because of uh, the lack of setbacks in a lot of places, which was just good sound policy, particularly for the Chattahoochee, but other rivers in, the, uh, in, this, uh, in this area too. I put in a bill that was, it was not passed, but it became a model for around the state of Georgia requiring parents in divorces before a divorce is granted to go to counseling, generally court-sponsored if they couldn't pay, but programs that looked at the impacts of divorce on children, and that became a model uh, from, uh, 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 for around the country. Um, probably while one could debate whether, uh, reading the pros and cons, I'm proud of the fact that uh, I also passed the indigent defense program that has uh, taken sort of 159 uh, systems of providing indigent legal care into a statewide system, and, and it certainly had some level of controversy or not, but I'm, I'm really more proud of taking something that nobody said could pass, that folks have been trying to pass for 30 years, that ultimately was gonna be imposed by a court in a much more expensive method than, than, than if we chose to do it ourselves, but take something, an issue that had been out there and, and actually having that passed into law and signed into law by uh, Sonny Perdue in his first term as governor. I was at that point in time in the majority and that does help, but it was a bipartisan effort that I worked very closely with uh, Terry Coleman and DeBose Porter and the House Judiciary Committee to do something that everybody knew in their hearts, you can disagree with those specifics, but knew in their hearts was morally, and con morally right and constitutionally mandated but ain't nothing you could ever go home and say, I ran on providing lawyers for criminals. Uh, you can't do it. But uh, you know that was uh, something of significance that I do think has, 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 has changed. A lot of county commission issues, as much as those was just trying to, the old uh, unfunded mandates, is really trying to keep a handle on, uh, on, 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 on the, the passion with which legislators often have about balancing state budgets on the backs of county commissioners. <laughs> And uh, it's, a, it's a pet peeve of the commissioners. I don't blame them. It's very easy to impose laws that, uh, that have to be funded downstream. And of course, we complain about the same thing from Congress. So you try to be a little bit of a watchdog. <laughs> What's good for the goose or what ain't good for the goose should also not be good for the gander. So those are, those are a few things. Then you decide to run for lieutenant governor. Well, Just at a point when the Republican Party was really picking up steam in the state of Georgia. I think it was. We felt the good part about being a Republican from sort of the mid 80s or even early 80s on, uh, you had a sense of destiny. You had a sense that time was on our side. You had a sense that we really were, while maybe smaller in numbers, and I'm not putting anybody down, but I'd have taken a Coverdale or an Isaacson or a Paul Hurd or a Bob Irvin or a Steve Stansel or even Matt Towery and Mark Burkhalters and I could take a Clay Land and a Senate and a Charlie Tanksley, uh, 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 David Ralston, uh, 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 myself, uh, a, a number of the other, uh, Skin Edge, uh, Sally Newbill. These folks were top flight intellects and they were daggone good politicians and they were fun to be around and it was an enthusiastic, progressive, conservative group and, and so 
that was a march that we felt was uh, that that was inexorable. Uh, took a little long. <laughs> it always takes a little longer. It's those final steps that are the toughest ones. But for me personally, and that was '98. Um, and you know, best laid plans. Part of it is as a practicing lawyer, when you're in the minority, somewhere between like six or eight years, you, you kind of get that sense of. I can't afford to do this anymore. I love doing it, so I'm either going to try to run for something else, move up the ladder, uh, or I really have got to get back to building my practice. And particularly when you're in the minority, I think those pressures are a little, those footsteps are a little louder than, say, if you're a key chairman uh, in the majority party where you can rationalize some other, uh, other exposure. So that was part of it. I felt it was a great time, and I'm not picking on him because he's a dear friend, but at that point in time, I felt that Mike Bowers is going to be a, a shoe-in uh, for the Republican nomination, and I thought st uh, absolutely, and I, I still think that today, but for, uh, we know the obvious history, that he would have been governor. And I saw myself, not necessarily correctly so, but I saw myself as that kind of Republican, and that if I could get, a, you know, the, the, the nomination, which I didn't, I lost to, uh, uh, to, to Mitch Scandalakis, which shows you how things go. Uh, but and, and part of that was again all this milieu when 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 folks uh, when when what happened with Mike and the issue of, of 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 his affair came out, and that was certainly more disastrous then than it would be now. Gosh, seems like today almost people applaud you, uh, but that was not acceptable, and he, and he paid a high political price for it. I don't want to blame his success or lack of on mine or not, but my idea was these were the kind of Republicans that were going to break through. Uh, Guy Milner got in that race, and, uh, 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 you know, I don't blame him one iota, uh, uh, but it sort of turned the tables upside down, and uh, I wound up uh, 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 losing it. I had been elected the minority leader uh, in 96, uh, and minority leader was a great, it, it was a personal accomplishment. But uh, you talk about a position that neither has carrot or stick, <laughs> trying to be a minority leader of any group of individuals, all who think they know your business better than you do, and you have no ability to impose your will. I'm honored to have had it, and I was unanimously elected, and that was one of the great honors. You know, might have been, do you stay, uh, you know, one, two, four, another two or three terms? Uh, where might you have been in the Senate? Uh, uh, I, you can't look back. Uh, Eric Johnson came up behind me, wound up being the uh, minority leader and then and majority leader in pro tem, and he did a fine job uh, and was a uh, uh, and was and still is. Of course, he's a, right now as we're doing this as a candidate for governor in the Republican primary. Uh, so I don't look back in that respect. But you know, in funny ways, I lost that as as, as we well know. Probably the last thing on this earth that I would have ever sought to do uh, would have been running as a chairman of a, of a political party. <laughs> which I always somewhat categorize as a cast of winged lizards who all <laughs> get together to find to figure out who is the most ideologically pure of the, in our case, the right or the, or the left in ways that will ensure that if you adopted all their positions, you couldn't get elected anything. <laughs> uh, but I, I ha and I say that with, with real affection though for it. And after I had lost, Paul Coverdale in fact, and several folks uh, were talking about we needed somebody with political experience. Roy Barnes, this was post 98. The Demo we thought we were going to break through. We lost everything. Uh, and I say everything. We still held Bobby Bakers and the PSCs. But in terms of the governor was Roy, lieutenant governor was Mark Taylor, attorney general was Thurbert Baker. Uh, uh, Oxendon was insurance and remained there. Uh, uh, remained there. And then uh, uh, Michael Thurman was labor. And it looked like we had just been held in check. And uh, 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 so they wanted somebody with political uh, uh, experience. And after you've lost a race, I guess you're looking for one, some ways to uh, both vindicate or, uh, uh, if you will, find some return on your investment. And at a certain point in time, I, I was honored to be asked and uh, put together another uh, uh, campaign. And, and those who, 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 you have regular political campaigns for popular vote, and then you have caucus campaigns <laughs> that are completely, or party campaigns, if you will, that are completely different animals. They're very personal. You got to get in your car. You drive down and talk to one person at a time uh, in small towns, small crossroads, and convince them that you're the best person for uh, running the party. I think we had three people in the race, all fine people, and I won the election on the first ballot, fortunately, uh, in Augusta in in '99. Um, what, one, what was your platform? What did you tell them? That if you can't count to 50 plus one in politics, stay home. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it, 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 it's great if you want to have a breakfast club that it's a debating society, 
those are fun. I would love to be a great barroom philosopher. I, I thought I was one of the best out there. Uh, 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 but political parties are about winning elections. They're about nominating people who are the better and superior candidates. They're about recruiting not just a warm body, but a civic and community leader. Uh, they are about platforms that don't have to, uh, you certainly don't want to abandon conservative principles, but you've got to find ways to put those principles out there that bring people to you, not limit and build barriers. And this is, it seems like, like ABC stuff. Try selling that, and I'm talking about both parties, but, but you know, this, this, this is not necessarily an easy sell. They all think they're doing it. Well, if we just be more and more this, we'll win. And we'll just be more and more to the left, uh, we'll win. You're just not pure enough is why we didn't win. Where the reality is American elections are decided in the middle, always have been, always will be. That doesn't mean the others don't have a voice or a place, but it's the same 8 to 10 to 12 percent of people that make the difference in every significant election because they're the ones who vote every time but are independent and they're going to go with who they think viscerally. I mean, the same group that voted for Ronald Reagan, voted for Bill Clinton, voted for George Bush, and are now voting for Barack Obama. And if you can't figure that out, then it seems to me you've missed a fundamental underpinning of American political victory uh, campaign and, and uh, strategy. Not necessarily party. Parties have a role. They're the place where the ideological purists are going to be. And it makes sense. And you do, and they do build enthusiasm, and they provide a face for your party out in communities where, in many respects, you know, they may not otherwise see a, a, a party official who represents it. So it's, it, it is important, and they're, they're, they, they provide enthusiasm. But I basically talked about winning. What are the pieces that we need to do to win? And, and quit pointing fingers at each other. Uh, and start figuring out what it is that differentiates us from the Democrats and articulate it in a way that takes that 10% that do make the difference and bring them over. Uh, sometimes it's because what other people do, they thought they didn't like Roy Barnes. They voted for Sonny Perdue. Uh, uh, they could go back next time back to Roy Barnes if they figure out they don't like the Republican candidate uh, or, you know, depending on what other national events might play. But you can't benefit from that uh, as, a, as a party. Uh, in terms of winning victories unless you're in a place to win. And that means the door's got to be open and you better be able to define things in a way, as I said, my very simple campaign slogan, if you can't count to 50 plus one, stay home. There was a time when people, And I've been on both sides of that 50 plus one count. There was a time when people thought that the uh, Republican Party was not inclusive. You worked on that. Were you successful? <sighs> We were very successful, and then we've somewhat what have been been harmed to a little bit by uh, by our own success. Uh, some of that's the eternal cycle of, of politics of, of of youth vigor, complacency, and senility, <laughs> which is probably the category I'm in now. Uh, and then reinvention. Uh, you got to be in, reinventing yourself in this business. And this idea that the Democrats are gone forever in Georgia, the Republicans are going to are forever out in Washington is utter nonsense. Uh, because never underestimate the ability of people to blow their opportunities and the uh, uh, opportunity for others to reinvent themselves. Republican Party, and I want to give credit to a couple folks that aren't necessarily intimates of mine. One was Barry Goldwater, who came out here and redirected and, and reinvented the word Republican uh, in the South. Uh, and the other one was Guy Milner, who doesn't get much credit, uh, but was really the, the, the first post-Callaway uh, Republican to actually win the vast majority of small rural counties that were always hardcore conservative, but were, you know, yellow dog Democrats. And he brought them into the Republican fold, where they've stayed ever since. Now, that dovetailed with some national policies, growing national conservatism and the Republicans and a perceived liberalism with the Democrats. Uh, but, but he, as much as anything, helped break those barriers down. What we did here locally was we went out and, and really did canvas the areas. And I've, I think I said this last time, and I'm not picking on them, but I'll go to Democrat meetings here, and there are a bunch of old guys like me complaining about Yankees and telling, you know, not very funny jokes. And you went to the Republican parties, and there was dynamic, progressive, smart, and I don't mean they were all Ph.D. types. Uh, but from the Warren Herons at a Lockheed to a Johnny Isaacson to a Johnny Gresham to a, you know, local Republicans here from Tom Sharon and uh, Al Johnson, uh, 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 Chuck Clark, which groups like this in, 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 in the greater donut area. 
Uh, but you have to get inside the Republican Party any further. See, we always, not only do we have schisms ideologically, but we have schisms geographically. And I'm not going to say any names, but the original sort of core of that Republican base, which was Buckhead, you know, North Fulton area. They've never liked us clowns out here in Cobb County, you know. <laughs> so you always have to deal. You know, the assumption is if you're on this side of the river that you're somehow an inherently a, uh, uh, a, 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 an intellectual dead end. <laughs> <laughs> with really nothing to offer it because if you were successful particularly as a lawyer obviously you'd be living in Atlanta and Buckhead and be part of them so by definition you're not so you know that I'm being obviously over the top and being a little bit cliched and you, you can obviously tell what camp I perceive myself to be in and some of that same sentiment flowed back the other way it's not fair to a lot of them but that's where you sort of got that idea of sort of closed-knit country club you know high-end economically high-end folks, which are great people, and gosh knows we need them, and that's, that, that's, there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But that's just the start of a political party. You need suburbs. You needed working families. You needed up and coming. You needed young professionals. You needed, uh, you know, uh, uh, all types. While we haven't recruited well African Americans in the traditional African American be belt, but out in suburbia where neighborhoods have been easily and comfortably integrated for years, we were pulling in those kind of people, and the results showed. So I think. Combined with both history and, and, the, and Goldwater and a, and a Milner and a lot of individual efforts to put a face on the party that could go into a barber shop and could go down to Main Street and could go to these places and sit down and talk to people. You know, Zell Miller was as good as anybody I know. You know, he could go to a bank board meeting and put on his pinstripe suit like this one and, and, and it sound as upscale as anybody but certainly roll up his sleeves and put on the cowboy boots and sit down at the barber shop or the, or, or the local trading center uh, and, and everybody feel like they're talking to somebody who's listening to them. And that's half the fight is you just have, give people that sense that you're listening to them and you share some of their dreams, you share some of their heartaches, you share some of their challenges, you share some of the economic issues and you mean it and you actually live it. And if you do those things, you'll grow a political party. Uh, because there's always, there is always competition. It, it breeds and grows in politics just like it does in business. And, uh, you know, you want to keep a politician sharp and on their toes, have an op opponent every few years. <laughs> it's amazing what that does to keep them responsive to constituents. You mentioned Lockheed, and I'm glad you did, because I don't think in our last conversation we fully covered the role of your family yeah. in Lockheed, Bell Bomber and Lockheed mm -hmm. and Dobbins Air Force Base. Would you talk to us for a minute about that? Sure, and, and, and I'll, I can I will encapsulate that uh, effort of many, uh, and a product of certainly the Second World War. My grandfather, uh, General Lucius Clay, uh, had been an engineer, and at the, it was an engineer his entire career. West Point grad, 1918, but in the year or two before the war, had been tapped out from a civil engineering position to come and head up the crash uh, uh, airport development program around the world. And they did, I can't, hundreds, 600, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of airports were established uh, around the world. Being from Marietta, Georgia, and of course realizing, that for a variety of reasons, this was a transportation hub, but it was also his home. Uh, one of the airfields they built was uh, Rickenbacker Field out here at, uh, in Marietta, which at the time was going to be the second airport, <laughs> at least in their view, post-war second airport for the uh, for the Atlanta area and certainly a number of from uh, uh, Rip Blair and Jimmy Carmichael and others uh, sort of worked to make that happen when war broke out this uh, the second part of that was and his assignment was uh, he was made at, uh, in charge of uh, procure, all procurement and development uh, for the United States uh, military effort uh, uh, for the uh, for the for the army which at that point in time included the Army Air Corps and again, a group of uh, Marietta citizens uh, came to Washington and met with them and said, you know, I, I, Marietta, I think, would be a pretty good place if you're gonna, we're going to be building these big airplanes and big machines and big ships. We, we don't have a harbor here, but we do have an airfield, uh, and we want you to see if you could help us put a, a plant here, war development plant, which wound up being, they did. Uh, the the citizen, leading citizens got the land, uh, put the package together, uh, as Bill Kenney, one of our local historians around here says the only question is asked is uh, uh, who's going who's gonna to build those airplanes? The only thing you got is what, uh, you know, hillbillies and bootleg <laughs> bootleggers. Uh, they couldn't turn a screw or a bolt if they had to. So said, yeah, thank you, but uh, we'll train them. And they did. And they built the schools here. And so he helped bring what was then Bell Bomber. They built the schools, put in three shifts a day. 
uh, seven days a week and, and, and built uh, uh, hundreds of B-29 bombers, which at the time was the most sophisticated piece of fighting equipment in the world, much like the F-22, which is now being built on top of that hill today. And so it's a wonderful story of civic involvement, a little bit of luck and happenstance, a lot of vision and leadership, uh, and a great company with great products that after Bell became ultimately Lockheed Georgia, and its success story from the C-5 and C-130s and F-22s is just a history in and of itself. An economic engine. It, it, it transformed, as any historian will tell you, Bell Bomber transformed Cobb County from a small rural backwater southern county into an industrial uh, a giant of its time. But uh, the, the multifaceted economy that you see in Cobb today is directly attributable to the commitment of Bell Bomber and Lockheed Georgia. Well, it also uh, provided jobs for people outside of Cobb. Zell Miller's mom, one of them. Lester Maddox. Lester Maddox. Yeah. Uh, you go down. If you go to anybody in this area much over 50, 60 years old, they know somebody in their family, one of their parents, invariably worked at Bell Bomber. Mm -hmm. Invariably. I mean, it was. You can imagine a small carrier running three shifts uh, seven days a week. Uh, they brought people from all over, North Georgia, South Georgia, East, West, North, put, up, put all the little cracker homes you see out there along Atlanta Road and up, up, up around the airport, put in schools and trained them. Uh, it not only transformed here, which it did, but its impact was statewide. You mentioned Matt Towery. Uh, Matt's been a guest on our program. Yeah. And we talked to him about uh, Insider Advantage. Mm -hmm. You once were president of yeah. Insider Advantage. still am. Still are. Mm -hmm. Well, what are you up to nowadays with that uh, company? For me, it's more of an investment. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, uh, in a day of, of, of for, for sometimes very good and sometimes not, of, of days where uh, it's hard to actually ever find a character anymore, you know, Matt Towery still falls in the category of a character. Uh, you want to have a fun time, go have lunch with uh, Matt Towery and turn on the recorder and talk politics. <laughs> you will, you, you will, you will have a, you'll have a great time and you'll learn some. Uh, fun, creative uh, mind. And what we're really trying to do and still trying to do is match both, you know, serious uh, uh, political reporting, a la Dick Pettis, uh, mm -hmm. long time, you know who Dick is, but long time AP writer who now sort of heads up our Inside of Georgia website. Uh, daily news update with everybody goes to I mean Dick's the dean of the reporting crowd out there and he's good at what he does very good at what he does and a little bit of the political when I say insider t taking the information that have both been gleaned and learned and sometimes suffered through uh, and get ahead of the curve on asking questions or bringing dots together um, what we don't do we, we're not trying to be in this community the, the blogosphere that's out there that's in the business of tearing people down we we don't get into personal lives, even when those personal lives cross into a public uh, arena. Uh, we'll let others do that. We might get criticized for it, but I think there's, there, there's, we'll let the blogosphere figure out exactly what the rules ought to be out there in terms of people's uh, uh, personal lives and what might occur. But I'm very proud of our product, and um, we also, Matt really heads up, which is a lot of what we're trying to move to is the uh, polling side of business. And Insider Advantage Polling was actually rated on a national firm, the third most accurate polling firm in the uh, last presidential cycle elections nationally. Uh, we're very proud of that. as a small business here in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Atlanta that, uh, that uh, we were able to get that level of accreditation out there from, uh, from uh, those in the business. So for me, it's more of an investment. I, I enjoy it. I, I spend my time either practicing law or, or building my lobbying firm. Uh, but it's still something that's a part of, uh, of, of me and it's something I've enjoyed doing. Good. I just wrote an article in our last magazine, sort of lobbying uh, when the shelves are bare. <laughs> that's James. Yes, sir. And that's and and, and that, that, I'm glad you said that. We have really the only monthly political magazine, and it was really an afterthought. We did all this daily reporting, and this is Matt, and this is where he is creative. Said, well, we need to take some of this, the best of it, and I can very inexpensively. His family had been in the printing business for decades, and put together a very inexpensive product that gives us something three dimensional that people who like to touch and hold something. Uh, can go and uh, uh, put their hands on, and our rule was no article could be longer than one trip to the bathroom. And, <laughs> and we've tried, we've tried to hold firm to that, and it works. <laughs> well, getting back to Republican politics, uh, old line Republicans are fiscal conservatives and, and disciples of smaller government and less spending. Many believe that the party has gotten away from these basic 
fundamental since Ronald Reagan. Do you think that's true? There's some truth. Beauty is always in the eye of the beholder, and, and politics is an always moving you know, uh, 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 object, if you will. I, I, it, it would be easy for me, and I think it's true, that uh, particularly in Washington, uh, there was a sense, and I think I personally think, with a with a with a certain amount of, of truthfulness to it, that Republicans got too much focused on being the majority and enjoying the perks of it than they were about being fiscally conservative, holding the line on on budgets. Yes, the Bush tax cuts were very helpful and probably did as much as anything to bring out the recession, just as Zell Miller did the same here with redirect and tax cuts in Georgia, uh, in in, in uh, eighty ninety. Uh, uh, I'd give George Bush credit for that, but the Congress and the ultimate later conduct of trying to have the traditional guns and butter that doomed LBJ. If you're going to fight a war and it's that important for the security of this country, then explain why it is that we need to sacrifice and go fight the war. Uh, I did not understand how you can grow your budgets, grow your domestic budgets, throw money at everything to keep folks on the reservation and people happy, and then fight a war that was just hemorrhaging uh, red ink out of this uh, country. And I'm not saying that's not the proper policy. History will judge that. Economically, you couldn't stay on those two tracks, and I think the Republicans paid a high price, combined with some of the controversies that occurred up that coincided, but a lot of, of, of good Republicans felt like, and again, truthfully, that they're no different. They really are no different. Uh, and, and, and there obviously was a time when the, the, the Gingrich Revolution and folks came in and there was some faces and that again that sense of intensity, enthusiasm, and mission that was uh, that uh, was dissipated, if not lost, over a period of time. And uh, again, they suffered a high price when they all, uh, you know, uh, Obama and the Democrats just swept them out uh, in this past election cycle. Um, I don't think you can just lock yourself in stone, Democrat or Republican, and say we've got it now. Uh, and what was good then, and I'm not talking about the Constitution, what, it, what was good then is still good now. Uh, but, you, but you've got to give, you still have to have a anchor, and you still have to have principles. And the principles that got Ronald Reagan in were by and large very inclusive. They were very simple in some respects, not easy to necessarily implement. But we're going to cut taxes, we're going to win the Cold War, and we're going to uh, cut the owner's burden of government on small business. Uh, and repeat it and do it. And if it doesn't meet those, uh, those tests, uh, then, then find some other way to do it. Uh, now, what that looks like today may be a little bit different from what it looked like in the 80s and probably should be in some respects. But you're seeing the same thing now with Obama with the incredibly high expectations of, I mean, his popularity and those of the Democrats on this, whether it be a, an expansive health care that most Americans right now don't trust. Uh, those are the type of things that, that, that make the Democrats look like they're simply appealing to the furthest, hardest left uh, of their party as opposed to mainstream. There goes that 10 or 12 percent. And in, in another two and a half, three years, if that 10 or 12 percent is as disaffected as it is today, you'll see a Republican get elected. I'm not saying they'll necessarily take over the House or the Senate in, in one term or sweep, uh, but uh, Obama and the difficulty Obama has the difficulty Obama has is he has that albatross of owning all arms of government. I about decided the best way to excel is to have divided government. Because I, and I, he's, uh, 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 my, my phone is always here. Barack has never called me. I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not holding my breath. But I suspect in a candid moment, if he's having one of his uh, uh, beer summits in the, <laughs> in, the, in the garden behind the house, I'm sure he would say, give that house back to the Republicans. If I could just get rid of Pelosi and those, those crazies from San Francisco, I love to visit there, but the politics is killing me. Uh, he'd do it in a minute if he could keep the Senate and then force in the middle where he could get something done. Uh, same has been a problem here in Georgia. Sonny Perdue, you got to give him high marks. He, he was the guy that capitalized on a disaffection and his timing was right on, on a shoestring budget, pulled all of that together. The House, the Senate's now all in firm Republican control. And, you know, there, there could be a discussion as to whether or not uh, that, uh, that it has been the most uh, legislatively productive, because what happens is everybody starts squabbling as to who's most important. And uh, not everybody, everybody who's, in the, everybody who's a Republican in the General Assembly sees themselves just as important as, the, as Sonny. Uh, I'm sure every Democrat years ago would see themselves as important as Zell, <laughs> or whoever it might have been. 
and so you have that tension where if you have a little bit of a split, those folks can stay at each other and it lets governance go on. Uh, 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 so going back to the Republican side, there is angst. Uh, amongst Republicans. There is tension as to, again, that, that visceral sort of ideological reaction is to get more pure. And you've got to have that anchor. I'm not saying don't. But if you're getting more cure, uh, uh, pure, it really winds up basically building walls to young professionals, to African Americans, to Hispanics, to, you know, uh, uh, women, to, you know, group after group. You're down to about 35 percent of the vote and boxing yourself in tighter. So angst is not bad, but as I, and again, I'm looking at it through my perspective, it needs to be coupled with outreach and serious outreach because right now the demographic trends are not going in the direction of Republicans, which means you can win um, you know, the accidental victories or the confluence of a particular uptick or downtick or things come together, uh, but day in and day out, statistically, you're still a minority. Uh, the idea is to statistically build what looked like seven, eight years ago is the demographic trend of the Republican way and now has stopped and, and that's got to be reversed or the future is at, at best difficult for traditional Republicans. And how you combine the, the, the social issues with the f fiscal issues, it, it, you know, they're in the perfect answer because people feel passionately about you know, abortion. People feel passionately about their Second Amendment rights to firearms. People feel passionately about government regulation and, and, and taxes. But keeping them all together when it, you know, your issue in your mind is the single one issue that defines it uh, is not the way to build a party. Uh, it doesn't mean you're going to have Nancy Pelosi join or, 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 or that ilk of the, of the Democratic Party, but you better be able to find comfort so that people who don't agree with you on your key issue but maybe agree with you on the two-thirds of the others, as Ronald Reagan used to say, they're a friend, not an enemy. And that's what parties have to be able to be willing to do if they're ultimately going to win. Was it a mistake to go to Iraq? I can't be a judge on that. Um, you know, you get way above my, my, my pay grade. I would say I, <laughs> I majored in the Middle East long enough to go uh, at the University of North Carolina enough years ago to now be a, a windbag. Uh, uh, I have always had enormous angst that sending limited troops into an area which I still share today with thousands of years of histories and animosities with the religious overtones uh, is ultimately a, a going to be successful in fundamentally changing that part of the world. Uh, I think the hope and the endeavor, if you will, I think that the, the ideal of what was being achieved was both noble and purposeful. But I do question, I do question uh, whether you can fundamentally change a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years of history with fifty thousand, a hundred thousand, or ninety thousand. Uh, what are the ways that we can achieve that goal by limiting its purpose, killing the bad guys, but not committing us either to an unending conflict or, or even worse, failure? Uh, because at some point in time, Americans will come home. And it had better be in a way, it had better be in a way that, that, was, that the impact is positive, but most importantly, that which we were really trying to do, which is eliminate the bad guys and not simply create a, yeah, you have to create a better platform. But ultimately, that's up to the local people. We simply can't oppose it from here. So, you know, in hindsight, would I have liked to have seen this maybe a little, would I like to have seen us focus it more on, 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 on Afghanistan, on building Pakistan's resolve, on truly trying to clear out those, uh, you know, the mountainous Pakistani-Afghan border, uh, building up the infrastructure in that nation? Uh, uh, yes. But I hope history is going to say that a, 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 not an America like Iraq, but that a, 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 a stable government with at least a majority of popular support is taking hold. And if 10 years from now that is a, a, a government that still exists today, I do think that would be success. Others will have to judge it. Will it be worth the cost? And did it truly contain uh, 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 terrorists and uh, uh, religious fanatics? Too early to say. Are we winning the war on terror? I think we're winning it in the sense that uh, we have not been attacked. We are winning it in the sense that a lot of truly evil, evil human beings have been killed and contained. 
uh, I think I think in terms of that aspect of it, uh, it has been successful because we've been safe now. We're going on ten years, uh, eight nine years, going on ten years. Uh, uh, um, the other side, and I, it, and and of course I don't have the answer. And smarter minds and many more try to wrestle with how do you just get rid of. Uh, 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 what, uh, th this bad guy if another one's just going to pop his head up and have a safe haven. So we've got to find a way that there's some ability to curtail the recruiting of bad, evil fanatics, uh, to have stable governments in Pakistan, and encourage more people in the world to both invest money and quite candidly blood to ensure that, uh, that, 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 that the most dangerous havens are simply not safe. And so we're well on the way to being able through technology and drones and, and communications to, to keep knocking the heads off the snakes, but we haven't quite gotten to a place where the den of snakes is cleared out. And uh, that's gonna be a long one. And I don't know that there's ever total victory in the way that we thought of as in World War II with Germany and Japan, uh, because the world will remain a dangerous place. But I think, I think we'll all have a sense that, that it is a safer place when it truly is. Uh, uh, and, and, and for that, I think you have to stay at it. I think you have to stay on it. And even I give uh, Obama uh, uh, you know, credit. He's committing troops to, to Afghanistan. Uh, he's not doing it on an unending basis, and he's been willing to drop those drones into Pakistan whenever they get a tip. And he's killed and been willing to take the heat for, uh, for doing so. That's got to continue. I'd like to ask you a two-part question. First of all, how would you assess the George W. Bush administration? And secondly, who are the shining stars of the Republican Party who might be in line to become president? Gosh, now you're getting way uh, from, from, from a national level in perspective. Um, again, uh, you know, one of the things that his historians or even folks like us love to do is race to judgment. Uh, you were around long enough to, you know, Harry, Harry Truman was run out of town on a, uh, on a broom, and I can remember even as a kid saying that he was the worst, most corrupt human being ever, incompetent moron ever to, uh, you know, occupy the, the, the White House. And history has a very strange way. I don't, there's not a president who doesn't run now who doesn't quote Harry Truman as being one of their heroes. Not a one, Democrat or Republican. Uh, uh, so it's, it's, you know, uh, you know, during the 70s when I was in school and out there, we lost Vietnam. But, you know, I could make a plausible argument that we actually won in Vietnam, even though the country was united uh, under, a, under a communist regime. Uh, it was contained. The uh, you know, Soviet Union is gone. Uh, it w if you look at it as part of an overall somewhat connected global struggle, you may have lost the battlefield. But you really win in the war. I mean, Vietnam is more capitalist now than it was in South Vietnam when folks are there. And I'm not saying that that means it's a democracy. But my point is you could make an argument that the price paid in some respects that a historian could look at and say is the overall struggle, uh, it was part of a victorious policy. Uh, George Bush, um, if, 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 if obviously if Iraq turns out as being a, a stable platform, uh, and the economy turns itself back around, I think in a very few, few short years, in a very few short years, he will be looking at of having courage of conviction and the willingness to take the heat and stay up late at night uh, when you know you're sending uh, uh, young men and women to, to death. Uh, and anybody who says that a president or a commander doesn't care are just being idiots, and, and it's insulting. They do agonize over it. I've seen it firsthand. Uh, and uh, in, in my own family, I'm not talking about it in the White House. Uh, I don't think, and, and, and in terms of a person in his own life, I think we'll get high marks. I do think the collapse of Republicans and the idea that we can keep everybody happy uh, simply by keeping, giving everybody enough to, to uh, take home the bacon is a, is a, it will be a, a weak link and will be his Achilles heel on how it's judged domestically. Uh, Iraq will be the defining issue. It's just too early to tell. The other one would probably be a C at best. Though his tax cuts, the early on tax cuts that we're still benefiting from today will be the other potentially, I think, very successful. Any economist will tell you they as much as anything helped drag us out of the earlier recession that we had when he was coming into office. Not exclusively, 
but deserves credit for that. But I think domestically you're going to see an unraveling of what looked to be Republican domination, a lot of that based upon foreign involvement and the, and the, and the, and the incursion into Iraq. If that winds up succeeding, I think he'll have a pretty good place. If it doesn't, he'll be mid-level at best. Shining stars. Uh, you got your uh, you got your card ready <laughs> uh, to uh, to jump in the fray. Um, well, I, if uh, gosh, you got to look out. You know, nationally, you're seeing. You know, you've got to give. Uh, 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 you know, some of the folks that were out there last time. I, you know. Huckabee certainly appealed strongly to the conservative base. This most recent incident with these four officers being killed on a, uh, an individual that he had at some level allowed him to be paroled when he was governor. That's the kind of thing that can just kill you, certainly in a Republican primary. Not saying it will, and there's a lot of time. You got to look at a Mitt Romney. I do think, you know, while there's, there's, there's not perfection on that, I think at a time and place where the economy is reeling, somebody like that has a, has a lot of, of, of sort of a, appeal out there. Uh, in terms of, 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 of the, uh, the House and the Senate, it's, it's probably too early to tell. You've got an Eric Cantor up there at Virginia who gets very high marks in, uh, in pulling the uh, Republicans together and, and capitalizing effectively on the issues that have been given to him, like health care and federal spending. Um, uh, 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 you know, uh, Senate, uh, you know, you've got good local leaders like uh, uh, Mitch McConnell, but probably not uh, sort of presidential. Just doesn't have the the, the, the pizzazz and personality. Uh, and 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 you know, right now, I, 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 if you look out further, I'm, I look back more to my own uh, uh, backyard. You know, you have young guys like a Lynn Westmoreland who've got a lot of talent that have been up there for a few years. You know, Jack Kingston is still has the potential of being a a, a major a, a major player. Uh, if you look in the, uh, 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 in the uh, um, uh, House and, and the Senate, there's, a, there's of course, the House will, will know in a day or two who, who the leadership might be. But I do know in the Senate, with folks coming up like a, a, a Chip Rogers, uh, a Ronnie Chance, uh, who are very bright, articulate, good message people. Uh, there, gosh, there's, there, there's a variety of others. That, uh, Tommy Williams is certainly somebody that, uh, that, that has potential. The t tougher part is not, you know, in my view, is not necessarily who are the bright signing stars. The stars will arrive. The problem is, for a variety of reasons, politics is, is growing, is attracting fewer and fewer of the kind of people that you truly want in politics. Successful business men and women. Not perfection. Not people who have lived a world of casting stones uh, at, at other people's glass houses but people who've lived in the real world, whose lives are open and public, not perfect, uh, but have worked to make their communities better and have succeeded. Uh, when you have the vast majority of Congress now peopled by folks that that's the best job they've ever had, we're in a fundamentally different place because it's more about job security than it is political risk and ideas and willing to lose because you always go back and knew you could succeed in business. It wasn't that long ago where people had their businesses, uh, and you had a long session and a short session, uh, and uh, uh, you came back and tended to the farm, or you tended to the store or the shop, uh, uh, and we're not going to go back to that. But it's tougher and tougher. You see more people coming into politics based purely on a single issue, a single passion, sort of activism, but don't really, in my view, represent the core of any nation, which is the performing citizens. And if we don't do better just attracting the high performers to come in, that doesn't mean that they have all the answers. But if we're not getting the high performers to come into politics, then you do scratch your head at what point in time, and this has always been a concern of mine, is, is at what point in time do they simply become irrelevant to American policy? Uh, and I'm not sitting there animating for a minute that, you know, there's a Julius Caesar that's going to cross the Potomac like the Rubicon and, 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 and take control. But Congress is more and more dancing, how many angels dance on the head of a pin, while families are out there trying to find a job. And, uh, 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 you know, with, 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 with support and, uh, and positive ratings at all times, I mean, almost a single digit lows, uh, if, you, if you held an election for, for Congress only, would anybody vote? And I really mean that sincerely. If you didn't have a presidential 
or a gubernatorial race or back home county commission and, or mayor's races and things like It was just a vote on Congress. Would anybody vote? And I'm, I'm afraid that the answer might be a little bit surprising. Uh, it's not that they don't, that they're looking for somebody better. A lot of people just don't care. They think they're just buffoons and beyond repair. Uh, now, everybody's always likes their own congressman or their own senator to a certain extent. And that's always true. And I don't mean to be gloom or doom, but I, I would like, and some of it's the media, some of it's, it's the crawl that the media does up everybody's life. Uh, uh, it, it's it's the, the absolute extremists on both sides of the parties. They, they become shriller and with the blogs and all the talking heads and the radio, left and right, uh, it becomes more ideologue. You know, our system, and I've, I've, made, I've said this before and I don't want to get trying to sound too profound, but if you're driving it down to purely being hardcore, however you want to define conservatives versus hardcore liberals, then, you, you know, we, you'd have a parliament. Because that's, that's the English system, and that's a democracy. There's nothing wrong with that. But our system, from the very inception, was designed to force to the middle. And political parties represented a broad base of constituencies. There was always some gap, but if you can't, and, and, and the presidency, the checks and balances were all designed to ensure that these folks at some point in time are going to have to find the middle ground or nothing gets done. We're rapidly getting to the point where nothing's getting done. So, you know, people do need to take a look and say, it's real easy if I can run from a district that's 85%, no, 70% Republican or 70% Democrat, which is what reapportionment has created now. Because it's real easy. You can just go to the right or go to the left because the only place you're ever going to get defeated is from the left or the right. And we've created that in, in so many districts nationally and, in, and locally that that same politician who a few years ago would have to go to the union hall out there at the machinist union, if you're a Republican, as well as your traditional Republican base, or if you're a Democrat, would have to get down there at the, uh, you know, the most conservative uh, pro-business chamber group and, and tell him why their tax policies were going to grow businesses. And that, that forced something in the middle. But now you see less and less of that, and I do think it's something that we ought to take stock of. I don't know that there's an easy answer, uh, but somehow make public service not necessarily a permanent career path, but also make it something that's admired, admired. The people I admired, you know, I had a great joy of looking up to people, and they weren't just elected officials. Some were behind the scenes, some were public policy, some were in public service, but really giants. Uh, and, and I'm sure they had all their warts and imperfections that we didn't look at then when I was a kid, and you didn't study in the books, where the text is more about the failings and the successes. Uh, but were, were, in my mind, and whether they were a Richard Russell or whether they were a Dwight Eisenhower or whether they were my own father or granddad or other, uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, Walter George or people like Zell Miller that governed and, you know, Republicans like Paul Coverdale and Johnny Isaacson, uh, 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 you know, these are giants and they would, they, would, they would and did succeed at anything they would have and chose to do. And they're role models, and we need to find ways to get back where it is, a, it is an admirable calling, uh, it is a shining calling, and that you find a way to make it look like you're making change and that you don't have to sit there for 30 years uh, simply to draw a paycheck and call that public service. And I, you know, that's a big fat question more than it is a, it's an observation uh, more than it is, I guess, a conclusion or resolution. But we do need to do something about it. Chuck, I don't want to open a can of worms, but I'd like to get your thoughts on the subject of reapportionment. Yeah. Since we're required to do it every 10 years. Yeah, well, reapportionment, as we all know, is the single most political process that you can endure. Uh, and I've seen sort of what I thought were highs and lows. I had, when I first went to the Senate, and I was sort of at the cusp, sort of the but at the tail end of what would have been considered the, something by the good old days or bad old days, and then some of the new computer scrutiny and information that we started having from the mid-90s on. It is, an, it is an innately political process. It should be. Um, but I think we have gone overboard to a level because of almost uh, information overkill that has wind up abdicating and leaving that responsibility to the courts. I think the first question is, why does the General Assembly do it? They do it because it's the single greatest protection they have for either re-election resurrection uh, or, or political uh, uh, demise. Uh, and so it is a, it's closely guarded. A couple of states do have neutral or independent panels. And if you ask from a policy wonk, 
position. Is that how it ought to be done? Absolutely. The chances of politicians giving up their very existence to a neutral, objective body in this state, at least, probably slim to none uh, in, my, in, in, in our political lifetime. Uh, it's just not going to happen. But I watched reapportionment move from, I was, when I was first elected, and you were talking about a young guy from Zell Miller being dumped, I, but Pierre, uh, I guess that, that yeah, Zell was governor. Pierre, uh, just out of the blue, plunked me on the reapportionment committee in, in 90, and uh, um, I guess it was 91, or not, and when you do it for the, uh, the census, in 90, I can't, 91, 92, whenever the year is that you actually draw the bills up, and I was within my first term and uh, living large and learning. At that point in time, we were one of two Republicans on the committee. Tom Phillips, who was the minority leader, was the other one, and, and, and myself. And two things that I remember distinctly out of that one. Number one, Culver Kidd sort of was heading it up. And to his credit, he got a big map of Georgia. And I was up in his office with folks and uh, a big map. Uh, and they started circling sort of geographic and economic hubs. You know, we need a, you know, this is the, you know, carpet area. Here's the poultry industry. You know, Augusta Metropolitan, Coastal, so, you know, Savannah to, to Brunswick, um, Agricultural Breadbasket, you know, Colum and, and, and then Metro Atlanta, both in terms of Republican, Democrat. And, 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 and it struck me, they really did, but nobody will believe it. They began the process by trying to identify what should be the areas represented, not who should represent them. And uh, I gave them high marks, completely different animal for both parties subsequent there too. The other thing I learned about reapportionment uh, was, was how personal it becomes because Tom Phillips, who was a great guy from out in Gwinnett, uh, was certainly angling for a potential. They had to draw a Republican district either in Cobb or Gwinnett in that cycle. Uh, and Tom was from Gwinnett and certainly had certainly some interest in running for Congress and, uh, and I was from Cobb, so we had the Cobb-Gwinnett side of things. And Culver and the guys, a couple of Democrats came, came to me, literally, uh, I, I don't want exact paraphrase, but they hated Tom Phillips <laughs> uh, for political reasons, not personally, uh, but said, we are no more going to give that SOB a chance to have a district and fly to the damn moon. Uh, I don't know anything about Cobb County. We need to protect Buddy over there. But other than that, draw, draw a daggone district. Well, you know, being the, the, uh, the, uh, the absolutely... Uh, reasonable uh, wonk that I am. Amazingly enough, it just overlapped my Senate district 100%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was a perfect borderline uh, for Mrs. Clay's idiot Ch Chuck, his son Chuck, to even have an opportunity. My point of that was sometimes being there, being personal, but also starting from a place was what's best for Georgia, all combined for the last what I thought was, was a quasi-objective uh, political map for the state of Georgia. Uh, uh, did the Democrats try to load it in their direction to a certain degree? Yeah. But you didn't have. What happened in the interim was suddenly the voter ID drives and the computer information that you could literally go into a reapportionment, the, the office, and break down a community and go down to a street. And if you wanted to identify person by person as to whether they were going to be a Republican or a Democrat. And party wonks, and we've both done it, have basically come up with these plans that says Chuck Clay, who lives in Marietta, would rather be represented by a Republican from Bainbridge than a Democrat who lives three doors over, which Buddy Darden did. And I'll just pick Bainbridge out of the blue. But the idea that party ID was more important to cast my vote than somebody who lived in my own daggone community. And what would somebody from Bainbridge know about Lockheed? Or what would I know if I was the one in, uh, you know, vice versa about agriculture down in that part of the state of Georgia? And it, we began that disservice of creating districts that were unified in many respects by nothing more than what was perceived or real party affiliation as opposed to any shared community of interest. And every state has suffered because of it. And we have built super districts wherever we could. Uh, at first, you know, it wound getting there. We had what was called the, 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 in, in the next cycle, uh, the Black Max Plan, uh, which allowed, uh, the underpinnings of it were very profound and, and probably correct, which is no question that uh, African Americans have been discriminated against at every level, including the ability to both vote simply vote and absolutely run for office. And so there was that historical correction that was taking place. But what happened was, and this is part of the Republican takeover, if you grew up absolutely as many overwhelming African-American districts as you could in Georgia, whatever that number is, 35, 40, 45, 50 percent African-American, what's the flip side of that coin? It put in Republicans everywhere else. So what used to be moderate conservative swing Democrat areas either became 
African-American if there was enough base to build it, or they became Republican. And uh, those ones became almost exclusively 100% uh, 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 guaranteed Democrat or 100% guaranteed Republican. But I think it splintered a lot of communities of interest in the process to maximize the political, uh, 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 the, the, you know, the political imperatives. The truth of the matter is the two biggest beneficiaries of reapportionment over the last 20 years in Georgia have been Republicans and African Americans. The, the dinosaur was white, moderate, or even conservative, traditional uh, Democrats vanished from the map of, of the state of Georgia. Let's get back to Chuck Clay now. Are there any future generals, lawyers, or politicians coming along in the Chuck Clay family? I'm trying to really assure that we move back more to half-wits, <laughs> <laughs> bootleggers, <laughs> and hillbillies, whatever, whatever the earlier description was. I was the guy... Yeah, I want to make sure that we were the ones that couldn't get a job at Lockheed. <laughs> um, I've got five kids. Uh, it's been an enormous honor and privilege. I'm an old guy. I've got a, a daughter who's graduating from the University of Georgia uh, uh, almost as we speak with a uh, education degree as a benefit of the Hope Scholarship, uh, a product of, uh, of uh, uh, Governor Miller. And I'm proud I can tell my daughter that I cast a vote to create the Hope Scholarship that allowed her to, uh, at uh, little or no cost, to attend a superb university. Uh, uh, what a wonderful circle that is in terms of both politics, uh, 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 up, uh, upgrading, if you will, of our educational institutions and, and a member of my own family. I've got a bunch of smaller kids and uh, it's too early to tell. I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, there, there's, a, there's the smart one, there's the athletic one, there's the Harley Davidson waiting to happen, and then there's my little daughter. <laughs> uh, this community has given me a great opportunity. I don't pretend to put anything I've done on a category of some of the folks that we've discussed here, both in my family and not. Uh, I, 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 as a historian by background and somebody who loves to discuss and look at these things, I, I, I enjoy discussing perspectives because I, I think it's important and meaningful and, and something like this. Uh, I, I'm, I'm proud to have played a small part of it. I hope there are other, that my kids are as fascinated with or admire public service uh, and public policy uh, as much as, as, as and, and imbibe as much of it as I was able to do. You know, I, I could grow up hearing what it was like to serve on the staff of Douglas MacArthur or sit across the table from uh, Joseph Stalin or, you know, the, the, what, what, uh, you know discussions about uh, Vietnam and the strictures and the things or organizing Eisenhower's presidential campaign. And I say that not of necessarily of importance because those same things could be said about local leaders, whether it be a mayor or city council, the, the, the Ernest Barretts of a community that have made in many respects, Bell may have been the engine and Ernest Barrett was the messiah that brought uh, Cobb County. These people are, are, are giants. I, I, if I do one thing, I would like to imbue in my five kids sort of that love of community and love of service. And whether, as my dad used to say about West Point, said, I'm never going to ever tell you that I think you ought to go to West Point. I'm never going to do so. Uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if your passion, if, it, if it's not something that drives you on a daily basis, there's somebody right behind you who would give their right arm to be there. But if you do want to go, I'll help you any way I can. I'm never going to tell these kids they ought to either run for office or do this or be lawyers or whatever. But I would do, it's a cliche and the love of any parent, be the best you can be. But do know who and what got you where you are. And if you do that, then, then, then there'll be not only Clays, but a lot of other generations of uh, successful uh, political business and uh, community leaders. Well said. Well, Chuck, on behalf of the... Uh the Duckworth Library at Young Harris College and the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. I want to thank you for being our guest. Well, it's a privilege. I hope we didn't scramble history too much, but everybody, as I say, everybody's got a view and is entitled to one, and uh, it's an honor. It's a privilege, and, and uh, I hope uh, at some point for those who are really looking at the minutia of politics that uh, if this plays some small role and and, and helping to, uh, folks to understand uh, uh, who and what we are, then I'm proud to have been a part of it. And for you and everybody at, at both schools, Merry Christmas and uh, long and successful lives. Thank you. Thank you.